Letter 6 on sharing knowledge. I feel, my dear Lucilius, that I am being not only reformed, but transformed. I do not yet, however, assure myself or indulge the hope that there are no elements left in me which need to be changed. Of course, there are many that should be made more compact or made thinner or be brought into greater prominence. And indeed, this very fact is proof that my spirit is altered into something better, that it can see its own faults, of which it was previously ignorant. In certain cases, sick men are congratulated, as they themselves have perceived that they are sick. I, therefore, wish to impart to you this sudden change in myself, I should, which hope and fear and self-interest cannot sever. The friendship in which, and for the sake of which men meet death. I can show you many who have lacked, not a friend, but a friendship. This, however, cannot possibly happen when souls are drawn together by identical inclinations into an alliance of honorable desires. And why can it not happen? Because in such cases men know that they have all things in common, especially their troubles. You cannot conceive what distinct progress I notice that each day brings to me. And when you say, give me also a share in these gifts which you have found so helpful, I reply that I am anxious to heap all these privileges upon you, that I am glad to learn in order so that I may teach. Nothing will ever please me, no matter how excellent or beneficial, if I must retain the knowledge of it to myself, and if wisdom were given me under the express condition that it must be kept hidden and not uttered, I should refuse it. No good thing is pleasant to possess without friends to share it. I shall therefore send to you the actual books, and in order that you may not waste time in searching here and there for profitable topics, I shall mark certain passages so that you can turn at once to those which I approve and admire. Of course, however, the living voice and the intimacy of a common life will help you more than the written word. You must go to the scene of action first, because men put more faith in their eyes than in their ears, and second, because the way is long if one follows precepts, but short and helpful if one follows patterns. Cleanthes could not have been the express image of Zeno if he had merely heard his lectures. He shared in his life, saw into his hidden purposes, and watched him to see whether he lived according to his own rules. Plato, Aristotle, and the whole throng of sages who were destined to go each his own different way derived more benefit from the character than from the words of Socrates. It was not the classroom of Epicurus, but living together under the same roof, that made great men of Metrodorus, Hemarchus, and Polynaeus. Therefore, I summon you, not merely that you may derive benefit, but that you may confer benefit, for we can assist each other greatly. Meanwhile, I owe you my little daily contribution. You shall be told what pleased me today in the writings of Hikado. It is these words. What progress, you ask, have I made? I have begun to be a friend to myself. That was indeed a great benefit. Such a person can never be alone. You may be sure that such a man is a friend to all mankind. Farewell. 7. On Crowds Do you ask me what you should regard as especially to be avoided? I say, crowds. For as yet you cannot trust yourself to them with safety. I shall admit my own weakness, at any rate, for I never bring back home the same character that I took abroad with me. 
Something of that which I have forced to be calm within me is disturbed. Some of the foes that I have routed return again. Just as the sick man, who has been weak for a long time, is in such a condition that he cannot be taken out of the house without suffering a relapse, so we ourselves are affected when our souls are recovering from a lingering disease. To consort with the crowd is harmful. There is no person who does not make some vice attractive to us, or stamp it upon us, or taint us unconsciously therewith. Certainly, the greater the mob with which we mingle, the greater the danger. But nothing is so damaging to good character as the habit of lounging at the games. For then it is that vice steals subtly upon one through the avenue of pleasure. What do you think I mean? I mean that I come home more greedy, more ambitious, more voluptuous, and even more cruel and inhumane, as I have been among human beings. By chance I attended a midday exhibition, expecting some fun, wit, and relaxation, an exhibition at which men's eyes have respite from the slaughter of their fellow men. But it is, and was, quite the reverse. The previous combats were the essence of compassion, but now all the trifling is put aside, and it is pure murder. The men have no defensive armor. They are exposed to blows at all points, and no one ever strikes in vain. Many persons prefer this program to the usual pairs, and to the bouts by request. Of course they do. There is no helmet or shield to deflect the weapon. What is the need of defensive armor or of skill? All these means of delaying death. In the morning they throw men to the lions and the bears. At noon they throw them to the spectators. The spectators demand that the slayer shall face the man who is to slay him in his turn. And they always reserve the latest conqueror for another butchering. The outcome of every fight is death, and the means are fire and sword. This sort of thing goes on while the arena is empty. You may retort, but he was a highwayman, a robber, he killed a man. And what of it? Granted that, as a murderer, he deserved this punishment. What crime have you committed, poor fellow, that you should deserve to sit and see this show? In the morning they cried, kill him, lash him, burn him. Why does he meet the sword in so cowardly a way? Why does he strike so feebly? Why doesn't he die game? Whip him to meet his wounds. Let them receive blow for blow with chest bare and exposed to the stroke. And when the game stop for the intermission, they announce, a little throat cutting in the meantime so that there may still be something going on. Come now, do you not understand even this truth, that a bad example reacts on the agent? Thank the immortal gods that you are teaching cruelty to a person who cannot learn to be cruel. The young character, which cannot hold fast to righteousness, must be rescued from the mob. It is too easy to side with the majority. Even Socrates, Cato, and Lelius might have been shaken in their moral strength by a crowd that was unlike them. So true it is that none of us, no matter how much he cultivates his abilities, can withstand the shock of faults that approach, as it were, with so great a retinue. Much harm is done by a single case of indulgence or greed. The familiar friend if he be luxurious, weakens and softens us imperceptibly. The neighbor, if he be rich, rouses our covetousness. The companion, if he be slanderous, rubs off some of his rust upon us, even though we be spotless and sincere. What, then, do you think the effect will be on character when the world at large assaults it? You must either imitate or loathe the world. 
but both courses are to be avoided. You should not copy the bad simply because they are many, nor should you hate the many because they are unlike you. Withdraw into yourself as far as you can. Associate with those who will make a better man of you. Welcome those whom you yourself can improve. The process is mutual, for men learn while they teach. There is no reason why pride in advertising your abilities should lure you into publicity, so that you should desire to recite or harangue before the general public. Of course, I should be willing for you to do so, if you had a stock in trade that suited such a mob. As it is, there is not a man of them who can understand you. One or two individuals will perhaps come in your way, but even these will have to be molded and trained by you so that they will understand you. You may say, for what purpose did I learn all these things? But you need not fear that you have wasted your efforts. It was for yourself that you learned them. In order, however, that I may not today have learned exclusively for myself, I shall share with you three excellent sayings of the same general purport which have come to my attention. This letter will give you one of them as payment of my debt. The other two you may accept as a contribution in advance. Democritus says, One man means as much to me as a multitude, and a multitude only as much as one man. The following also was nobly spoken by someone or other, for it is doubtful who the author was. They asked him what was the object of all this study applied to an art that would reach but very few. He replied, I am content with few, content with one, content with none at all. Written to one of his partners of his studies. I write this not for the many, but for you. Each of us is enough of an audience for the other. Lay these words to heart, Lucilius, that you may scorn the pleasure which comes from the applause of the majority. Many men praise you, but have you any reason for being pleased with yourself if you are a person whom the many can understand? Your good qualities should face inwards. Farewell. 8. On the Philosopher's Seclusion Do you bid me, you say, shun the throng and withdraw from men, and be content with my own conscience? Where are the counsels of your school, which order a man to die in the midst of active work? As to the course, which I seem to you to be urging on you now and then, my object is and shutting myself up and locking the door is to be able to help a greater number. I never spend a day in idleness. I appropriate even part of the night for study. I do not allow time for sleep, but yield to it when I must. And when my eyes are wearied with waking and ready to fall shut, I keep them at their task. I have withdrawn not only from men, but from affairs, especially from my own affairs. I am working for later generations, writing down some ideas that may be of assistance to them. There are certain wholesome counsels which may be compared to prescriptions of useful drugs. These I am putting into writing, for I have found them helpful in ministering to my own sores, which if not wholly cured, have at any rate ceased to spread. I point other men to the right path, which I have found late in life, when wearied with wandering. I cry out to them, avoid whatever pleases the throng, avoid the gifts of chance, halt every good which chance brings to you. In a spirit of doubt and fear, 
for it is the dumb animals and fish that are deceived by tempting hopes. Do you call these the gifts of fortune? They are snares. And any man among you who wishes to live a life of safety will avoid, to the utmost of his power, these limited twigs of her favor, by which we mortals, most wretched in this respect also, are deceived. For we think that we hold them in our grasp, but they hold us in theirs. Such a career leads us into precipitous ways, and life on such heights ends in a fall. More so, we cannot even stand up against prosperity when she begins to drive us to leeward, nor can we go down, either, with the ship at least on her course, or, once for all, fortune does not capsize us. She plunges our bows under and dashes us on the rocks. Hold fast, then, to this sound and wholesome rule of life, that you indulge the body only so far as is needful for good health. The body should be treated more rigorously, that it may not be disobedient to the mind. Eat merely to relieve your hunger. Drink merely to quench your thirst. Dress merely to keep out the cold. House yourself merely as a protection against personal discomfort. It matters little whether the house be built of turf or of variously colored imported marble. Understand that a man is sheltered just as well by thatch as by a roof of gold. Despise everything that useless toil creates as an ornament and an object of beauty, and reflect that nothing except the soul is worthy of wonder, for the soul, if it be great, naught is great. When I commune in such terms with myself and with future generations, do you not think that I am doing more good than when I appear as counsel in court, or stamp my seal upon a will, or lend my assistance in the Senate by word or action to a candidate? Believe me, those who seem to be busied with nothing are busied with the greater task. They are dealing at the same time with things mortal and things immortal. But I must stop and pay my customary contribution to balance this letter. The payment shall not be made for my own property, for I am still conning Epicurus. I read today in his works the following sentence. If you would enjoy real freedom, you must be the slave of philosophy. The man who submits and surrenders himself to her is not kept waiting. He is emancipated on the spot, for the very service of philosophy is freedom. It is likely that you will ask me why I quote so many of Epicurus's noble words, instead of words taken from our own school. But is there any reason why you should regard them as sayings of Epicurus and not common property? How many poets give forth ideas that have been uttered or may be uttered by philosophers? I need not touch upon the traditions and our writers of national drama, for these last are also somewhat serious, and stand halfway between comedy and tragedy. What a quantity of sagacious verses lie buried in the mime! How many of Publius's lines are worthy of being spoken by buskin-clad actors, as well as by wearers of the slipper? I shall quote one verse of his, which concerns philosophy, and particularly that phrase, of it, which we were discussing a moment ago, wherein he says that the gifts of chance are not to be regarded as part of our possessions, still alien as whatever you have gained by coveting. I recall that you yourself expressed this idea much more happily and concisely. What chance has made yours is not really yours. And third, spoken by you still more happily 
shall not be omitted. The good that could be given can be removed. I shall not charge this up to the expense account, but I have given it to you from your own stock. Farewell. 9. On Philosophy and Friendship You desire to know whether Epicurus is right, when, in one of his letters, he rebukes those who hold that the wise man is self-sufficient, and for that reason does not stand in need of friendships. This is the objection raised by Epicurus against Stilbo, and those who believe that the supreme good is a soul which is insensible to feeling. We are bound to meet with a double meaning if we try to express the Greek term lack of feeling, summarily. In a single word, rendering it by the Latin word impenentia, for it may be understood in the meaning the opposite to that which we wish to have. What we mean to express is a soul that rejects any sensation of evil, but people will interpret the, the idea as that of a soul which can endure no evil. Consider, therefore, whether it is not better to say a soul that cannot be harmed, or a soul entirely beyond the realm of suffering. There is this difference between ourselves and the other school. Our ideal wise man feels his troubles but overcomes them. Their wise man does not even feel them. But we and they alike hold this idea, that the wise man is self-sufficient. Nevertheless, he desires friends, neighbors, and associates, no matter how much he is sufficient unto himself. And mark how self-sufficient he is. For on occasion, he can be content with a part of himself. If he lose a hand through disease or war, or if some accident puts out one of his eyes or both of his eyes, he will be satisfied with what is left, taking as much pleasure in his impaired and maimed body as he took when it was sound. But while he does not pine for these parts if they are missing, he prefers not to lose them. In this sense, the wise man is self-sufficient, that he can do without friends, not that he desires to do without them. When I say can, I mean this. He endures the loss of a friend with equanimity. But he need never lack friends, for it lies in his own control how soon he shall make good a loss. Just as Phidias, if he lose a statue, can straightway carve another. Even so our master in the art of making friendships can fill the place of a friend he has lost. If you ask how one make himself a friend quickly, I will tell you, provided we are agreed that I may pay my debt at once and square the account so far as this letter is concerned. Hikado says, I can show you a filtre, compounded without drugs, herbs, or any witch's incantation, if you would be loved. Love. Now there is great pleasure, not only in maintaining old friendships and established friendships, but also in beginning and acquiring new ones. There is the same difference between winning a new friend and having already won him, as there is between the farmer who sows and the farmer who reaps. The philosopher Attalus used to say, It is more pleasant to make than to keep a friend, as it is more pleasant to the artist to paint than to have finished painting. When one is busy and absorbed in one's work, the very absorption affords great delight. When one has withdrawn one's hand from the completed masterpiece, the pleasure is not so keen. Henceforth, it is the fruit of his art that he enjoys. It was the art itself that he enjoyed while he was painting. In the case of our children, their young manhood yields the more abundant fruits, but their infancy was sweeter. 
Let us now return to the question. The wise man, I say, self-sufficient though he be, nevertheless desires friends, if only for the purpose of practicing friendship, in order that his noble qualities may not lie dormant. Not, however, for the purposes mentioned by Epicurus in the letter quoted above, that there may be someone to sit by him when he is ill, to help him when he is in prison or in want, but that he may have someone by whose sick bed he himself may sit, someone a prisoner in hostile lands who he himself may set free. He who regards himself only, and enters upon friendships for this reason, reckons wrongly. The end will be like the beginning. He has made friends with one who might assist him out of bondage. At the first rattle of the chain, such a friend will desert him. These are the so-called fair-weather friendships. One who has chosen for the sake of utility will be satisfactory only so long as he is useful. Hence, prosperous men are blockaded by troops of friends. But those who have failed stand amid vast loneliness, their friends fleeting from the very crisis, which is to test their worth. Hence, also, we notice that those many shameful cases of persons who, through fear, desert or betray, the beginning and the end cannot but harmonize. He who begins to be your friend because it pays will also cease because it pays. A man will be attracted by some reward offered in exchange for his friendship, if he be attracted by aught in friendship other than friendship itself. For what purpose, then, do I make man my friend? In order to have someone for whom I may die, whom I may follow into exile, against whose death I may stake my own life, and pay the pledge, too. The friendship which you portray is a bargain and not a friendship. It regards convenience only and looks to the results. Beyond question, the feeling of a lover has in something akin to friendship. One might call it friendship run mad. But, though this is true, does anyone love for the sake of gain or promotion or renown? Pure love careless of all other things, kindles the soul with desire for the beautiful object, not without the hope of a return of the affection. What then? Can a cause which is more honorable produce a passion that is base? You may retort, we are now discussing the question whether friendship is to be cultivated for its own sake. On the contrary, nothing more urgently requires demonstration. For if friendship is to be sought for its own sake, he may seek it who is self-sufficient. How then, you ask, does he seek it? Precisely as he seeks an object of great beauty, not attracted to it by desire for gain, nor yet frightened by the instability of fortune. One who seeks friendships for favorable occasions strips it of it all its nobility. The wise man is self-sufficient. This phrase, my dear Lucilius, is incorrectly explained by many, for they withdraw the wise man from the world and force him to dwell within his own skin. But we must mark with care what this sentence signifies and how far it applies. The wise man is sufficient unto himself for a happy existence but not from mere existence, for he needs many helps towards mere existence. But for a happy existence, he needs only a sound and upright soul, one that despises fortune. I should also like to state to you one of the distinctions of Chrysippus, who declares that the wise man is in want of nothing, and yet needs many things. On the other hand, he says, nothing is needed by the fool, for he does not understand how to use anything, but he is in want of everything. 
The wise man needs hands, eyes, and many things that are necessary for his daily use. But he is in want of nothing. For want implies a necessity, and nothing is necessary to the wise man. Therefore, although he is self-sufficient, yet he has need of friends. He craves as many friends as possible, not, however, that he may live happily, for he will live happily even without friends. The supreme good calls for no practical aid from the outside. It is developed at home and arises entirely within itself. If the good seeks any portion of itself from without, it begins to be the subject to the play of fortune. People may say, but what sort of existence will the wise man have if he be left friendless when thrown into a prison, or when stranded in some foreign nation, or when delayed on a voyage, or when out upon a lonely shore? His life will be like that of Jupiter, who, amid the dissolution of the world, when the gods are confounded together and nature rests for a space from her work, can retire into himself and give himself over to his own thoughts. In some such way, as this sage will act, he will retreat into himself and live with himself. As long as he is allowed to order his affairs according to his judgment, he is self-sufficient, and marries a wife, he is self-sufficient, and brings up children, he is self-sufficient, and yet could not live if he had to live without the society of men. Natural promptings, and not his own selfish needs, draw him into friendships. For just as other things have for us an inherent attractiveness, so has friendship. As we hate solitude and crave society, as nature draws men to each other, so in this matter also there is an attraction which makes us desirous of friendship. Nevertheless, though the sage may love his friends dearly, often comparing them with himself and putting them ahead of himself, yet all the good will be limited to his own being. And he will speak the words which were spoken by the very Stilbo, whom Epicurus criticizes in his letter. For Stilbo, after his country was captured and his children and his wife lost, as he emerged from the general desolation alone, and yet happy, spoke as follows to Demetrius, called Sacker of Cities, because of the destruction he brought upon them, in answer to the question whether he had lost everything. I have all my goods with me. There is a brave and stout-hearted man for you. The enemy conquered, but Stilbo conquered his conqueror. I have lost nothing. I, he forced Demetrius to wonder whether he himself had conquered after all. My goods are all with me. In other words, he deemed nothing that might be taken from him to be good. We marvel at certain animals because they can pass through fire and suffer no bodily harm. But how much more marvelous is a man who has marched forth unhurt and unscathed through fire and sword and devastation. Do you understand now how much easier it is to conquer a whole tribe than to conquer one man? The saying of Stilbo makes common ground the Stoicism. The Stoic also can carry his goods unimpaired through cities that have been burnt to ash, for he is self-sufficient. Such are the bounds which he sets to his own happiness. But you must not think that our school alone can utter noble words. Epicurus himself, the reviler of Stilbo, spoke similar language. Put it down to my credit, though I have already wiped out my debt for the present day. He says, Whoever does not regard what he has as most ample wealth is unhappy though he be master of the whole world. Or, if the following seems to you more suitable phrase, 
or we must try to render the meaning and not the mere words. A man may rule the world and still be unhappy if he does not feel that he is supremely happy. In order, however, that you may know that these sentiments are universal, suggested, of course, by nature, you will find in one of the comic poets this verse. Unblessed is he who thinks himself unblessed. Or what does your condition matter if it is bad in your eyes? You may say, what then? If yonder man, rich by base means, and yonder man, lord of many but slave of more, shall call themselves happy, will their own opinion make them happy? It matters not what one says, but what one feels. Also, not how one feels on one particular day, but one how feels at all times. There is no reason, however, why you should fear that this great privilege will fall into unworthy hands. Only the wise man is pleased with his own. Folly is ever troubled with wariness of itself. Farewell. 10. On living to oneself. Yes. I do not change my opinion. Avoid the many, avoid the few, avoid even the individual. I know of no one with whom I should be willing to have you shared. And see what an opinion I have of you. For I dare to trust you with my own self. Crates, they say, the very disciple of the very Stilbo, whom I mentioned in a former letter, noticed a young man walking by himself, and asked him what he was doing all alone. I am communing with myself, replied the youth. Pray to be careful, then, said Crates, and take good heed. You are communing with a bad man. When persons are in mourning or fearful about something, we are accustomed to watch them, that we may prevent them from making a wrong use of their loneliness. No faultless person ought to be left alone. In such cases, he only plans folly and heaps up future dangers for himself or for others. He brings into play his base desires. The mind displays what fear or shame used to repress it, wets his boldness, stirs his passions, and goads his anger. And finally, the only benefit that solitude confers, the habit of no trusting man and of fearing no witnesses, is lost to the fool, for he betrays himself. Mark, therefore, what my hopes are for you, nay, rather, what I am promising myself, inasmuch as hope is merely the title of an uncertain blessing. I do not know any person with whom I should prefer you to associate rather than yourself. I remember in what a great-souled way you hurled forth certain phrases and how full of strength they were. I immediately congratulated myself and said, These words did not come from the edge of the lips. These utterances have a solid foundation. This man is not one of many. He has regard for his real welfare. Speak and live in this way. See to it that nothing keeps you down. As for your former prayers, you may dispense the gods from answering them. Offer new prayers. Pray for a sound mind and for good health first of soul and then of body, and of course you should offer those prayers frequently. Call boldly upon God. You will not be asking him for that which belongs to another, but I must, as is my custom, send a little gift along with this letter. It is a true saying which I have found in Athenodorus. Know that thou art freed from all desires when thou hast reached such a point that thou prayest to God for nothing except what thou canst pray for openly. But how foolish men are now. They whisper the basest of desires to heaven. But if anyone listens, they are silent at once. That which they are unwilling for men to know, they communicate to God. 
Do you not think, then, that some such wholesome advice as this could be given you? Live among men as if God beheld you. Speak with God as if men were listening. Farewell.